Welcome, everyone. If I could please bring us to attention, even as you're w making your way through the food line, we're going to go ahead and try to get started more or less on schedule. Uh, my name is Doug Kaiser, and it's my privilege to introduce you uh, uh, to our speaker for this evening's event. Before I begin, let me first acknowledge the co-sponsoring organizations for the event, the Yale Climate and Energy Institute and the Yale Center for Environmental Law and Policy. This talk is part of our Climate and Energy Bookshelf series in which we're featuring speakers who've published recent or forthcoming books in the areas of climate change and energy policy. The remaining events in the series include a talk by Jedediah Pur Purdy next week on April 5th and by Sarah Krakoff on April 18th. I hope you'll be able to join us for those events as well. Tonight, we're extraordinarily delighted to welcome Dr. Daniel Jurgen back to the Yale campus. Dr. Jurgen is a highly respected authority on energy, international politics, and economics. In selecting him as one of the 100 people who matter worldwide, Time Magazine said, if there's one person whose opinion matters more than any other on global energy markets, it's Daniel Jurgen. The New York Times described him as America's most influential energy pundit. Fortune said he's one of the planet's foremost thinkers about energy and its implications. He is known around the world for his book, The Prize, The Epic Quest for Oil, Money, and Power, which was awarded the Pulitzer Prize. It became a number one New York Times bestseller. It was translated into 17 languages, and it became the basis for an eight-hour PBS, BBC television series. His new bestseller, which he will talk to us tonight about, is called The Quest, Energy, Security, and the Remaking of the Modern World. The book has been called a masterly piece of work by The Economist. It's been hailed by the Financial Times as a triumph. The New York Times said the book is necessary reading for CEOs, conservationists, lawmakers, generals, spies, tech geeks, thriller writers, and many others. Any spies in the audience tonight? Bill Gates summed up his review by simply saying this is a fantastic book. And during a recent appearance to discuss the book on the Colbert Report, Dr. Jurgen was lauded for helping Stephen Colbert understand why peak wind and running out of sun were not serious impediments to the deployment <laughs> of clean energy. <laughs> Educated at Yale and at Cambridge University where he received his PhD, Dr. Jurgen is vice chairman of IHS and founder of IHS Cambridge Energy Research Associates, one of the leading energy av advisory firms in the world. He's been awarded the United States Energy Award for Lifelong Achievements in Energy and the Promotion of International Understanding. The International Association for Energy Economics honored Dr. Jurgen for his outstanding contributions to the profession of energy economics and to its literature. He serves on the U.S. Secretary of Energy Advisory Board, and he chaired the U.S. Department of Energy's Task Force on Strategic Energy Research and Development. I could go on and on. In fact, I spent most of this afternoon trying to winnow his achievements down to just that list that I gave you. Let me instead conclude simply by saying that all of us here today are fortunate to be able to hear one of the leading thinkers in the world talk about the leading issues driving the world. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Daniel Jurgen. Thank you. Thank you very much for um, that more than kind and generous uh, introduction. I appreciate it. I'm very glad to uh, be here. I've learned something that it's much better to have the food at the beginning of the event than at the end of the event, and uh, impressed to, uh, to see that. Uh, you did mention uh, the Colbert Report, and those, uh, I guess most people know the Colbert Report. Uh, it's a terrifying show to go on because you know he's going to make fun of you. And, uh, but I, I, the one thing they told me before I go on is remember, he's the comedian and you're not. So don't make any jokes. And I was fine on everything until he, uh, as you pointed out, expressed grave concern about peak wind and what to do about it. And that that's kind of the point where I lost it. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to be here to have this discussion with you. I want to thank uh, the Center for Environmental Law and Pol Policy and also the uh, Energy, uh, the Climate and Energy Institute at Yale, uh, which I'm pleased to be on the advisory board of. And, uh, it's, um, and I really want to thank Dean Robert Post, who I've known for a very long time, who very graciously invited me uh, last autumn and uh, said it would be a great thing to come up and 
really, this has been the, the centerpiece of my visit to Yale, so uh, thank you, uh, Bob, very much. Uh, and also, although he's not here, I've known Dan Esty for a very long time, and I know he's part of the, the program. So uh, uh, this is an opportunity, and I, I thought what I would do this evening is use kind of the quest to talk about some of the major issues in energy, but start talking, you know, use frame a little bit what I was trying to do in the book. Uh, when I finished the prize, which uh, Doug referred to, uh, I wrote, it was right at the time of the Gulf crisis, and I wrote that uh, you know, the modern and mesmerizing alchemy of petroleum would continue, and we would continue to be in the age of oil. But that was a couple of decades ago. And with the passage of time, it was evident how so much had changed uh, since then. Uh, when I finished that book, there was something called the Soviet Union. It doesn't exist anymore. Uh, China was an oil exporter using oil exports to help finance its uh, economic uh, uh, revolution under Deng Xiaoping. Uh, climate change had no traction as a political issue. It really was hardly uh, an issue at all. Uh, no one had ever heard of shale gas. If it had any name at all, it was known as uneconomic gas because it would never be uh, economic. And oh, by the way, oil prices were going to be $20 a barrel. So much kept changing, and indeed, right up uh, as I was finishing the book, Fukushima happened, the nuclear accident that changed what was going to be a nuclear renaissance into a kind of nuclear patchwork in terms of development. And the Arab, what people call the Arab Spring and now call the Arab upheaval, unfolding, uh, uh, upsetting the strategic balance in the Middle East and still very unclear in terms of what the consequences are for the region and therefore the energy supplies of the region. So, so much had changed. So it seemed like a you know, good idea to write a, a book. And the other thing I wanted to do was uh, look at the whole energy spectrum and try and understand uh, how these things all fit together. And so it was really a learning process uh, for me to undertake this book, as the prize is really a process of, of discovery of seeing how things fit together. Now, I find uh, that when you write a book like this, it's very helpful to find what I call, the, to myself at least, uh, the emblematic personalities, the people who helped carry the story. And in the prize, there were more sort of swashbuckling entrepreneurs and risk takers. I have certainly some of those in this book. But this is a geekier book, uh, actually uh, among the many heroes of the scientists are the heroes of this book. And there's one person uh, in the book to kind of give you an example a chemist at Caltech named Ari Hagen-Smith. Uh, I checked with the two chemists in the room, because I wanted to say no one has heard of him. And I wanted to check to see if they'd heard of him. They hadn't heard of him, so I feel fairly confident saying nobody had heard of him at this point. But once a very distinguished uh, professor, uh, won many awards, uh, a, a great chemist. His particular interest was understanding flavors. So he figured out where the flavor for garlic came from, wine, onions. He's the man who figured out the active agent in marijuana. And it's alleged there's a statue to him somewhere in California uh, for that effect. Uh, but he was obsessed, actually, with the pineapple and understanding the flavor of pineapple. And he was working away in his laboratory at Caltech uh, at the end of the 1940s. And he went outside, probably for a smoke, but into what was supposed to be that beautiful California uh, air that uh, Bob and I remember from our childhood, uh, which you sort of sometimes saw. But uh, instead, he uh, encountered what he called that stinking cloud of uh, smog. And at that time, there was this huge debate as to where smog came from. And he said, you know, I'm a chemist, and I can figure it out. And he said he figured it out in the first nickel. He figured out that it came from the improperly uh, combusted uh, gasoline and automobile engines. And so out of that then started a process to uh, regulate emissions. Uh, that well-known environmentalist, uh, Ronald Reagan, set up the California Air Resources Board which is probably the most powerful agency that most people have never heard of, since it sort of regulates the world automobile industry. And the first chairman was Ari Hagen-Smith, and started this process that led to uh, the uh, institution of the requirement for zero emission vehicles, i.e. electric cars. And so you know, if you look at the Chevy Volts that are coming on the road today, 
you kind of find that they connect all the way back to um, uh, Ari Hagen-Smith and understanding where smog came from. And kind of what I was doing in this book is, throughout is trying to understand how things happened, how they came about. Um, another one, another example uh, was a young scientist who actually graduated with quite a good degree in science, uh, but the market, you know, young people today know it's hard to get jobs, and uh, the market for academics in his field was not good. Uh, he started doing tutoring to try and earn some money, didn't get any customers. Uh, he advertised free tutoring, as free samples of tutoring, didn't get any customers. His father wrote a, a letter to a, a, a scientist, uh, said, you know, my son um, grows more and more unhappy day by day, and he believes that his career has been permanently derailed. That, of course, was Albert Einstein. He did get a job in the patent office in Bern, and in that remarkable summer of uh, 1905, wrote five papers that changed the world, one of them about the photoelectric effect. Uh, so he really laid out the, 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 the theory of, uh, of uh, solar energy, of photoelectric, uh, of solar panels and so forth. It took the space race with the Soviet Union in uh, 1958 to actually get them put to use for the first time as an alternative uh, to the batteries that were going up in the satellites after the Sputnik. And so that was 1958, and here we are today in uh, 2013, more than 100 years after Einstein's paper, and solar has clearly made great progress. Uh, costs have come down. Uh, the largest uh, solar company in the world just went bankrupt uh, in the last uh, few days, as uh, noted even on the front page of the Yale Daily News. And uh, it's growing, but it's still a small business, and so kind of driving home the fact that uh, it takes a long time uh, in the energy business for things to change. It doesn't happen quickly. Just a couple of other examples of the personalities who are important. Those um, who have read the book will know that this is the only book on energy that's ever been written and that ever will be written, I'm sure, that talks about the worst moment in Ronald Reagan's career as an actor. Yes, I'll tell you about it. Uh, he, um, after his head of the Screen Actors Guild, he couldn't get work. And so, uh, you know, he was sort of washed up. And so the only work he could get was uh, doing stand-up comedy, fronting for a singing group called the Continentals in Las Vegas. Uh, did was pretty good at, at this joke telling, but actually couldn't, um, he hated it, thought his career was over, comes back to uh, Los Angeles, phone rings, it's his agent, Ronnie, and he has this job for him, as some in the audience will remember, as the spokesman for General Electric. Uh, he signs this contract, which today would be the equivalent of a million dollars a year, to go around and just give speeches for General Electric. In his contract, by the way, it says he will not fly, because as he writes at the time, uh, he, I'm one of those prehistoric people who have a fear of flying. He overcame that when he got Air Force One. It made it easier to, uh, to, to deal with. But he, um, uh, the reason I, I write about it is because at that point, the United States electricity demand was growing in the way that uh, Chinese uh, energy demand or Indian energy demand is growing at 10 or 11 percent a year, and it was very challenging for the United States uh, to meet that, and one of the reasons that we had the development of nuclear power to try and cope with it. And the, the relevance is what we see in the emerging markets today, the kind of challenges that assure that they have the electric power uh, that they need is now something that's not only of national importance but has global uh, impact. Um, I'll just mention two other uh, people that have helped tell the story. One is I sort of said, well, where did wind come from? Where did the modern wind business come from? And I kind of asked around a lot, and everything triangulated on this one guy named Jim Delson. Uh, and so I tracked him down and, and asked him about it. And he told the story of how he spent Chris, uh, New Year's Eve 1981 atop a wind turbine tower in the Tehachapi Pass in a blizzard in California trying to get this wind turbine up by midnight. And the reason it needed to be up by midnight is because that's when the tax credits expired. So he gets it up, and then it falls apart. But he got the tax credit. But he says, there's got to be a better way of doing this. So he goes off to Europe. He thinks, you know, the, the Dutch have had uh, windmills for a long time. So he says, well, we'll find them in, in Holland. But in fact, 
he ends up in Denmark and discovers is this industry, the sturdy Danish agricultural machinery industry makes much stronger wind turbines. He starts to import them to California. California becomes the epicenter as well as the birthplace of the modern wind industry. 90% of the wind turbines at one point are in California. And uh, so that's where the industry uh, begins and generous tax credits and everything. Uh, and so you know, the question of where did the modern wind industry come from, the answer is it's kind of the result of the marriage of the sturdy Danish agricultural machinery industry with California tax credits. That's why we have a wind industry. Um, one, well, I'll save that one other personality because uh, there's one other who's very important. But so those are some of the ways I tell the story. But, you know, those who, um, of you, and there are many here, who labor on books or even writing your, your papers, uh, know that the, you have to stand back and say, what's it all about? And the challenge, you know, in a way, I always find the kind of both the easiest and the hardest thing to write are the introduction to conclusions, because you have to decide what is it all about and what do you carry away? And so really, I realized from this whole enterprise, I think it's really about what seemed to me the three big questions about um, energy today. The first is the question about growth. That is, there we go through these cycles where we're running out of energy, where we have abundance of energy, and we've seen that again and again. Five years ago, peak oil, the notion we were kind of running out of oil was dominant. Uh, and, and, and I think that that belief system kind of fed on itself in terms of the markets. Uh, today, there's more confidence about the physical supply, not necessarily what happens above ground. But on the other hand, uh, we know that there's a, a challenge, and the challenge is a, of a economic growth of the emerging markets of these nations of rising income and their need for energy and the challenge of, of meeting it, that probably two decades from now, the world will be using somewhere between 30 and 40 percent more energy, and how's that going to be achieved, and what's that's going to be a mix. And that, of course, is a subject that for a lot of people as to uh, what that mix will be uh, in the future. But so that first question is just, are the, the abundance of supplies or the shortage of supplies. And, you know, I would re, was struck when people talked about peak oil a few years ago. We were running out. I said, it's true. We're running out of oil. And it's actually the fifth time that we've run out of oil. The first time we'd run out of oil was in the 1880s when the head of Standard Oil of New Jersey said, I will drink every barrel of oil you find west of the Mississippi. They found oil in Texas, Oklahoma. He forgot the promise. He moved on from that. But nevertheless, we've seen these cycles that we've gone through again and again. And then things like technology and price and new areas uh, adjust. And that's what we've seen in the last five years. The second uh, big question, if that's the question, is there enough? The second big question, uh, is energy secure? And I realized, actually, sort of in one of the uh, sessions I had with uh, undergraduates here, that in a way, I mean, I was brought into the energy field by crisis, by geopolitical crisis, and that probably has shaped my view, the question of energy security. And the traditional issues of energy security are still very much on the agenda. Uh, the same questions that burst onto the scene decades ago are still there today uh, with the confrontation and the standoff with Iran and the question of what's going to happen there. And it's the same question again, is the Strait of Hormuz going to be shut or not? And uh, not long ago, the chairman of the US Joint Chiefs of Staff said, yes, the Iranians can shut the Strait of Hormuz, and then we can open it. I mean, uh, in other words, you know, every, both sides have been through that a great deal. And uh, you know, for the last several years, people have said each year is going to be the critical year on Iran. I still find, I find that people who are deeply engaged think this probably might be, we're more or less in the critical, getting close to the end game one way or the other. So the traditional energy security issues are there. But there are kind of three new dimensions to it. One is just physical security uh, in terms of terrorism uh, and things like that. And what happened uh, about six weeks ago in the deep in the Sahara Desert in Algeria, where the gas plant was taken uh, hostage by jihadists, and uh, a number of people were uh, really executed. Uh, and, but the aim of, of, of those people was to actually blow up this plant and create you know, just a huge fireball of uh, disaster. 
And I know that what that has done is lifted the concern about physical security everywhere in the world about the energy system and energy infrastructure. Uh, the second aspect of it is kind of what, call, what I call an integrated energy shock. And the first one I think that we had, at least in this country, was Katrina and Rita in uh, 2004. Uh, and we just had it again with Superstorm Super Storm Sandy uh, in, uh, in the Mid-Atlantic and uh, the Northeast. And that's a situation where everything is down at the same time. You don't have power. You don't have fuel. You, emergency vehicles can't get fuel from gasoline stations because the gasoline stations don't have electric power to get the fuel out. And you have the immobilization of a region. And I kind of regard these as kind of warning of uh, what can happen. And so this question of preparing for these integrated shocks uh, so that when they do happen, there's a greater resilience. I have a former colleague who is uh, one of the key people in the city of New York dealing with it, and he said, you know, when Superstorm Sandy struck New York, he said, we were in the fog of war. We had no information. We didn't understand what was happening. Uh, I know New Haven was affected, and then, of course, the blizzard. And this just is a, a big warning when a region has done that. The third thing that's new is the cyber threat. And it's been uh, recognized. Uh, certainly for the last few years, but it's now at a, at a higher level. And what happened in Saudi Arabia last summer, when 35,000 computers were wiped clean, probably from Iran, uh, was a huge uh, warning. Uh, the isolation, the wall worked. It did not affect production, but it could have. And if it affected production, it would have created a, a panic in, in the world. And I think for, for the energy industry, this was a real wake-up call. Uh, Former Defense Secretary Leon Panetta warned of the risk of a, of a cyber Pearl Harbor. And then in the, in the State of the Union address, President Obama, the number one issue in, uh, that he cited in terms of cyber threat was the threats to the grid. So there is, I think, this kind of uh, sense that, uh, you know, that, uh, that there's this vulnerability there in the system. And, uh, and I know the electric power industry, the oil and gas industry, trying to cope and prepare, but there is a sense of, of, of great alarm uh, about this and the nature of the risk. The third big um, question is, of course, the environment question, the climate change uh, question. And it seems to me that climate change did not really gain political traction. I mean, there was a Kyoto Treaty in the late 1990s, but really not until the turn of this century did it really gain the kind of political traction uh, that we now see where it has become such a, a key defining issue for the entire uh, energy sector. So it's those three questions that, uh, that kind of are the three prisms that I guess I look at uh, energy through. Uh, and then you can look at the kind of specific developments that are happening in the world that fit into that. And there are a couple that, uh, a few that I want to kind of cite that are really important. You know, uh, we ha when people move into an office building, they have something called the build-out. And the build-out is you decide where the windows will be and where the Xerox room will be and where the offices will be and all those things. And I know we have uh, guests here from China. I think China is going through something that be that's never happened before, the build-out of a whole country. That is 20 million people a year moving from countryside to city. And when you do that, that means you need energy. You need energy for transportation. You need energy for work. You need energy for building. And so that kind of creates the, uh, this, uh, this embodies what's happening with uh, rising incomes and emerging markets. And for me, what kind of this simple numbers that tell the difference of how things are changing is automobile sales uh, in China versus the United States. In 2000, 17 million new cars were sold in China. Uh, in the United States and 2 million in China. 10 years later, 17 million in China and 12 million in the United States. And that kind of change is being replicated uh, across the world and is where the real demand growth is. And so we all know the phrase uh, globalization, but I think one of the things that I focus on is the globalization of demand. Uh, it used to be when you would look at energy balances, people would write about OECD, and then they had uh, ROW, and ROW was 
the rest of the world. Well, now the rest of the world is actually using more oil than the OECD countries, and that's the kind of shift that's happening. Uh, the second area where uh, this uh, shows up uh, is in terms on, is on the geopolitics and the security issues. And despite the growth of supplies elsewhere in the world, the Middle East is still the, kind of the center of world supplies. And there are many factors there that uh, create question marks for it. As I said, obviously, the unfolding of the uh, Arab unheaval in the region, uh, the youth bulge, uh, the distribution of population. There, I have a chart in the book that compares the distribution of population in industrial countries and uh, the Middle East. And it's, you know, it's very dramatic where you see this large young population that doesn't have jobs and doesn't have opportunities and uh, is a huge source of, uh, of uncertainty in those countries. Clearly, Al-Qaeda and its affiliates, and that's what uh, was at work in Algeria. Uh, and then Syria, which not an important oil producer in itself, but what happens in Syria, the results there will affect the whole region, beginning with Iraq, Turkey, Israel, but uh, perhaps the Gulf as well. And then the question of Iran, is, as, I, as I said, we have sanctions have, are in place uh, on Iran. They've worked more successfully than was thought. But that doesn't mean that there's going to be a, uh, some kind of settlement uh, to address the issue of uh, Iran's nuclear ambitions. And so I think that just kind of hangs over the whole region. It goes in and out of the news. So the geopolitics. Um, I want to turn to the technology side of it. You know, because I think for me, as I think about kind of other themes and takeaways, I mean, the two things that I feel that I've learned from this is one, you know, from this whole enterprise on energy, one is that price really matters. Uh, I had lunch today with a group of economists, and they thought that was a really good conclusion to come to. <laughs> <laughs> it took me a while to get there. Uh, and the other is technology really matters. And so, you know, wind and solar are, when we talk about renewables, it's wind, solar, and biofuels. Those are the, the main things out there right now. In terms of electricity, it's wind and solar. And uh, I described the birth of the wind industry. Uh, then the renewable industry really went through something that people who are part of that industry referred to as the valley of death in the late 1990s, where people hung on by their fingernails. And then this rebirth occurred. And the rebirth came about partly because of uh, climate change concerns, partly because of the need for energy to meet growing energy needs, uh, and partly technological progress because you just realize that those industries of the 1970s, 1980s, and 1990s were very immature industries. So, and then Germany was really the country that stimulated the rebirth of renewables. And it's a, it's a big business now. Last year, it was a $167 billion uh, business. However, with that said, it's gone through, it's had a period of great optimism. And I think it's now under more pressure in an age of austerity because while costs have come down dramatically, it still does depend upon uh, government budgets. And kind of, there was kind of a, a green bubble uh, that started around 2004, 2005. And I was very struck by a comment this week that the head of CalPERS, the largest pension fund in the uh, United States, uh, said because they had a really aggressive program to invest in renewables. And the chief investment officer said uh, it's turned out for them to be a noble way to lose money. Uh, kind of a stark phrase about it. Tell, so you know we're in another period, and I think a lot of the things that have been launched now at the technology frontiers, and some of you are involved in, they're going to take 10 or 20 years to come to fruition. But so I think it's a period of kind of consolidation and pressure for the renewable industry. Those industries were born in the 70s and 80s. If you said what was the biggest technological, the biggest innovation in energy since 2000 is shale gas. You know, it's just in terms of its scale and its impact, if you're measuring it just by its impact. And this is another really remarkable story of how it came about. And again, it's sort of one man, um, sort of a Steve Jobs of hydrocarbons, I guess we'd say, this man named George P. Mitchell, who is a Texas uh, not an oil man, but a gas man. And he believed in natural gas. And in the early, about 1982, 83, he read an article, uh, I 
as I understand it, uh, that suggested that you could in extract shale gas uh, from shale rock. And this was considered crazy. But he also had a contract. He had to deliver gas to Chicago, and his fields were running out. So he had an economic incentive as well. And he kind of had enough control over his company to kind of, he was a very stubborn man. Uh, and so the guys working for him said, George, you're wasting your time. You're wasting your money. He said, it's my money. I'm going to do it. And he continued to do it, but it took 15 years to get the breakthrough, 15 years to get the breakthrough on hydraulic fracturing. And then it took, they needed capital, so the business got then purchased by another company called Devon, which had another technology, which was horizontal drilling. And the two things came together in 2003, sort of proof of concept. And from there, it grew, but it wasn't very visible. People thought we were, the United States was going to import large amounts of LNG and spend $100 billion a year to do it. Lo and behold, 2008, suddenly, instead of continuing to go down, US gas production goes up. And people say, you know, my goodness, this is, uh, this is not what we expected. And that's when the large companies uh, enter the field. So today, it's really it's gone from being 2% of uh, our gas supply a decade ago to 37%. It's changed the economics. It's brought down gas prices uh, dramatically. Uh, it's brought down electricity prices as well. Uh, it has also, uh, well, I should maybe I'll pause on the environmental aspect. So as it's kind of, uh, as everybody knows, it started become a subject of, uh, of environmental controversy. So President Obama had a commission set up uh, to uh, look at the environmental side of it. And I was on it as chaired by John Deutsch, who had been the provost of MIT and deputy secretary of defense, et cetera. And uh, we'd look at the different environmental questions. We have hold lots of hearings, site visits, and everything, and come to the conclusion that, that the concern about chemicals as the scientists on it say, is extremely unlikely to have any effect, that the three main environmental questions are, what do you do with wastewater? What about air pollution, air quality? And what about community impact? Lots of you know, trucks come into community. And say that each of these is subject to uh, remediation. Each of them is subject to regulation. Each of them is subject to best practices and technology. And kind of that's what's unfolding. Uh, as, as we talk. Now, there's a big argument about whether the state should regulate, regulate this or the federal government should regulate this. And uh, uh, to, to me, uh, at least to the Americans in the audience, it kind of reminds me, as I was sitting in all these hearings two years ago, I kept thinking of the Federalist Papers. We were talking about the, what's the role of uh, the national government and the states. And I think it's uh, kind of uh, that argument goes on. But so there has been a lot of uh, addressing, a lot of effort. Uh, some companies, along with the Environmental Defense Fund, have now set up a center uh, just a week ago for uh, sustainable shale development, I think it's called, to kind of focus on best practices, what you need to do about water, what you need to do about air quality, what you need to do about your diesel engines, trying to address this range of questions. Um, but that develops, and, but then there's, once people see it's working for, sh for shale gas, they said, well, what about oil? So, they go, they go to this place called the Bakken in North Dakota, which is just, you know, just a few barrels of oil, and start developing it. And suddenly, we see that the same technology is really dramatically changing the position of the US in terms of oil in ways that would not have been thought of five years ago. Just wouldn't have been thought of. US oil production is up 40% since 2008. 40%, what does that mean? That's as much as Nigeria produces in its entirety. So this is a big number and is starting to, you know, we're seeing a rebalancing of world oil as a result of that as well as other developments in, I'll talk about in the Western Hemisphere. But it's interesting from a political point of view and an economic point of view to see the kind of shift that's gone on because the focus and I can see it in Washington, and I can see it, uh, it was very evident in the, uh, in the presidential campaign. The narrative has changed to focus on the economic significance of what's unfolding. Because uh, the numbers, 1.7 million jobs supported by what's happening in this unconventional oil and gas revolution. Uh, the United States becoming more competitive. Uh, I know when I was in Europe and you talked to you know, leaders of European business, very concerned about their ability to compete now, and, and very 
loath to make new investments in Europe. There are other reasons too, but uh, partly because of also this loss of uh, competitiveness uh, as the US because of uh, low cost uh, energy. So it's kind of having this impact on, on the global economy. Now, uh, the question is, is this unconventional revolution just a North American revolution? Um, I think it, it varies around the world. And some countries, I think, I see my, my observation is China is a country that has greater resources in this than probably the United States. It won't happen overnight. We'll go ahead. Uh, interestingly, Saudi Arabia is investing in shale gas uh, so that they can use it in electricity and have more oil to uh, export. Uh, Ukraine, uh, Mexico has great potential. Some countries have said no, like France. England has said yes. But it's going to be slow to develop, I think, in the rest of the world. But it is, there's no reason the technology is going to stay here. So there are three, um, three things that are happening in the Western Hemisphere that are changing uh, oil and the changing and rebalancing of world oil in a very interesting way. One is what I've already said, what's happening in US oil. And now, you know, I don't know if it's going to happen, but people are predicting 2017, 2020, that the United States will be producing more oil than Russia, more oil than Saudi Arabia. I think it, whether it gets there or not, I don't know, but it's going to be a horse race. And you know, that wasn't expected. The second thing is the growth of uh, oil sands. The amount of oil sands in Canada now, the output is greater than Libya was producing before the Civil War. And maybe in the question period, we'll have a word about the Keystone uh, pipeline, because uh, I know it's on people's mind. And the third is what's happening in Brazil with, uh, with the pre-salt. And Brazil now has the capacity to be producing more oil than Venezuela and being the oil powerhouse. So this rebalancing of world oil that's now happening has a lot of geostrategic connotations. It's early, but it's, you know, people are struggling to understand uh, what it might mean. Um, you know, so these are some of the dimensions I talk about. There's one other I want to talk about, and it's something that has always been a huge focus for me, which is the energy efficiency side of the equation, what happens on the demand side. And it's something that uh, I've focused on over the years. And in fact, US, like other countries, has made a lot of progress. The US is twice as energy efficient as it was a few decades ago, same for J Japan, uh, other countries. But, and the potential, I think, is there. We have tools that we didn't have before. And I think of energy efficiency as really an energy source. Uh, and it's just competitive with others. But there's one big problem with energy efficiency, and it was brought home to me uh, by the European Energy Commissioner when we were at a big uh, renewable energy conference in Washington. And he said, you know, renewables are great, but boy, we could sure get a lot of impacts quick from energy efficiency. He said, there's, there's just one problem. And I said, what's the problem? He said, there's no red ribbon to cut. There's no photo opportunity. You, there's nothing, you know, beautiful windmill you can photograph. You can photograph a plan, but there's nothing to photograph. Although I did actually, uh, in the quest, put in a picture of Croom Hall uh, 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 as an example of an energy efficient uh, building. Uh, and it's a very, a very handsome building. So I think uh, these are some of the, to me, kind of the major themes that are unfolding. Um, you know, there's a big question for everybody. What kind of cars will people drive in 10 years? Will they be more efficient automobiles? Will they be hybrid? Will they be electric cars? Uh, will, they be, uh, uh, will they be natural gas vehicles? We had a conference a couple of weeks ago, and I had the CEO of General Motors there, asked him that question, and his answer is, I don't know. You know, uh, you got to invest in all of them because this is moving. But I think the fact that our automobile fleet has to do about double fuel efficiency is a really uh, huge thing in this country. So I mentioned when I started that, you know, the, the issue figuring out how you want to, what do you want to leave readers with, and what do you want to kind of leave yourself with? And this issue of um, innovation is really the one that I find uh, most compelling, because when you look at this broad history of energy over the last couple of centuries, it's all about innovations that come along, that aren't expected, that change things. And I found a character to help tell that story, and his name is uh, Sadi Carnot. Uh, engineers will know the Carnot cycle, uh, uh, but, but he himself is not know, known. He died quite young in a cholera epidemic, and his papers were burned because of that. But he, 
was a scientist and engineer. And in 1824, he published a paper called The Motive Force of Power. And he wanted to explain how the steam engine worked. And he wanted to do it because he's a scientist and engineer. He also wanted to do it because he was a soldier. His father had actually been Napoleon's minister of war. And he thought that one region that Britain had defeated France in the Napoleonic Wars was because of its mastery of technology. And he wanted to teach the French to bring them up the learning curve uh, on this. And so it's interesting that even then, energy and geopolitics were entwined. And um, I found this wonderful phrase in which he talked about what he, he, he said that what's happened unfolded with the steam engine, uh, what he called the uh, heat machine and combustibles, he said was a, a revolution in human affairs and a revolution in human civilization. And it seems to me that that really is, in many ways, the story of, uh, of energy and a way to look at it. And it's one that actually fills me with optimism because of work that people here and many others uh, who are here in this room and others are working on, that, the, that we will, that there's no reason that innovation is going to stop. We're going to see breakthroughs. We're going to see things differently. And so that this, um, and that we have something else going for us, too, that we didn't have before, which is the globalization of innovation. It's not just a US project and maybe a Western Europe project. It's a Chinese project. It's an Indian project. So there's a lot more talent involved in uh, looking at these questions. And as I was talking with some, you can work virtually around the world on these problems in a way that wasn't possible before. So this kind of great revolution uh, in human affairs, uh, I'm convinced, uh, will continue. And it has to continue in order to meet the challenges of the future and, and the needs of a growing world economy. Thanks.